An activity diagram is a nice and simple way of visually describing a process, any kind of process actually, not just the behavior of a computer game or any kind of programs. In this video, I'll describe the basics of activity diagrams or UML activity diagrams as is their full name. Activity diagrams have been around for quite some years as demonstrated by this example I found from the University of Colorado Boulder. It's from 2008 and describes a process for renting videos. Who even remembers that you could go to your local video store and rent movies on tape to watch at home? But the example is still good and shows how easy it is to understand a process described by an activity diagram. So let's take a closer look. This process apparently begins when the customer approaches the counter with some videos and a membership card. Then the clerk has to scan the card and the videos, but the order doesn't matter. She can do both at the same time or start with the card and or start with the videos. But only when all is scanned can the process continue to verify the customer. How this is done isn't specified in this diagram. And that is an important aspect of activity diagrams. You don't have to specify how things are done, merely what is done and in which order. So, if the customer is delinquent, say he has stolen tapes before or paid with stolen credit cards, the transaction ends immediately and no videos are rented. If he is unreliable, say he has forgotten to rewind too many times or has returned broken tapes, then the clerk requests a deposit before going on with the rent transaction. If the customer is okay, the clerk goes directly to the rent transaction and tries to accept payment. If the payment, the credit card here, is refused, but the customer can provide another form of payment, then the clerk tries to accept that. If every form of payment the customer can provide is refused, the transaction ends immediately and no videos are rented. When and only when the payment is okay, the clerk has to update the stock, marking the videos as unavailable to other customers, and print a receipt to the customer. Once again, the order doesn't matter, but both must be completed before the rent transaction is complete and the customer can leave the store, ending the activity but with videos rented. To see how easy it is to understand an activity diagram, even when you don't know what all the symbols are, and that is the main point. You want to make it easy for other people to understand the process that you have thought out. You want them to get a quick overview of your idea without you having to be there and explain it to them. To be able to draw your own diagrams, you do need to know a bit more about the various symbols and rules for how to draw an activity diagram. So let's dive into it. First, let's get the definition. An activity diagram describes an activity, the as a collection of detailed actions and decisions. That means things happen in a given order, but not necessarily the same way every time the activity is performed. So they're more advanced than a simple recipe or sequence of events. In the example before, the diagram described what to do if or when something happened, like the customer being unreliable, but this isn't something that happens every single time a customer goes into the shop. That's why activity diagrams are very useful in describing interactive systems. You cannot plan what the user will do, but you can define what actions will happen when or if she does something or other. And games are interactive systems with very fixed rules and processes. Even board, card and dice games. All the players agree on the process and it could just as well be described as an activity diagram as text descriptions in a book. And computer games are basically just another way of describing a process. So creating a detailed activity diagram prepares you for when you are going to program the computer to follow the same process. That is, play the game. A bit about the UML standard. As mentioned, activity diagrams are called UML activity diagrams because they are part of the UML Unified Modeling Language standard from OMG and no. It does not mean what you think it does, it is the Object Management Group. They have built an enormous standard describing all sorts of diagrams, of which activity diagrams is just one. At a later stage you will probably encounter state machine diagrams, and if you continue with object-oriented programming, you will also meet class diagrams and probably sequence diagrams. 
The latest version of UML is 2.5.1 from December 2017, but activity diagrams hasn't changed much since UML 2 got introduced in June 2003. That means you can use most resources all the way back to 2004 if you would like to know more. And if you would like to know more, you can, and I really stress the can, go and read the UML specification on the OMG website. But it's extremely hard to understand, and I do not recommend it. You can just stick with Wikipedia and, of course, this video. If you really want to learn more about UML, I recommend Martin Fowler's book. Yes, an actual physical book, UML Distilled. But be sure to get the third edition, as it covers UML too. Do not go for the earlier versions. And of course, this only goes for if you want to learn more about the other kinds of UML diagrams. For now, you can concentrate on simple activity diagrams as explained in this video. So let's get started. There are four primary shapes in an activity diagram. The start, also called the initial node, nothing comes before that. The end, also called the final node, nothing comes after that. Actions that describe some action performed in the activity, usually something comes before and something else after. Decisions that describe when the flow changes, something comes before and then a decision has to be made as to what comes after. Let's look at them in greater detail. Start is drawn as a filled in circle or a disk with one arrow going out from it. There can only be one start in an activity diagram usually drawn at the top of the page. End is a disk with a circle around it. And as we have seen, an activity can have several different ends, but when either one of the ends have been reached, the whole activity ends. So you'll never have an activity diagram where you can reach one end and then another. When it ends, it all ends. Action. An action is a rounded rectangle with a description of something that happens in the activity. It always follows something else and always has an arrow to something else, often another action. Oh, and it must be drawn with rounded corners. That's important since a rectangle with sharp corners means something else. If you really want to know, they indicate a parameter sent to or from an action, something I won't cover in this video. An action can only have one arrow going out from it but it can have multiple arrows going into it. That is, several other actions can lead to this same action. Action often leads to another action. In this diagram, I don't show the start and end. I expect all the examples here to be part of a larger unseen diagram. So there must be an arrow from one action to the next and the order they happen in are always the same. The process cannot go against the arrow. Usually, you would draw from top to bottom or left to right, but there are no fixed rules for the reading direction, so remember the arrowheads. And let's take a look at an example activity. This is the activity diagram I follow each morning. First, I put on my pants. Then, I put on my shoes, not the other way around. And then, and only then, I go outside. I cannot go outside before I have put on my pants, at least not since the neighbor started complaining. Hence, I have the arrows in the diagram making sure the order is correct. This is very basic stuff, right? I just want to make sure we all agree on the rules for drawing diagrams. So now, let's look at decisions. A decision is drawn as a diamond, also called a rhombus, a square rotated 45 degrees. There's no text inside the diamond only on the arrows pointing away from it. The text describes a possible outcome of the decision. We also call it the criteria or sometimes the guard. And here we have one possibility. The arrow then leads on to another action or decision or maybe even an end. And then we have the other possibility with an arrow leading to that action. Usually you'll use decisions with only two possible outcomes like this one but it is possible to have more arrows going out from it as we saw in the introductory example. However, I recommend sticking to two outcomes and then having additional decisions following either of them. This will make it easier to follow and also once you get to implement it in code, it'll be much easier to actually program. 
And do remember, the possibilities, criteria, guards, they must be in square brackets. If they are not, it means an event sent to the next activity, something else I won't cover in this video. But let's see a simple example of a decision. First, we have a very generic example where we have to choose A or B. Maybe it's the choice between two different meals or two different payment options. First, we have to make the choice. That's something that is done outside the activity diagram, maybe by the user. Then a decision has to be made. If it was A, then we go that route and A was chosen. Maybe another example from my morning routine would be an order here. So every morning I look out the window to decide if I should wear shorts or long trousers. It depends on the weather. If the sun is shining, I go for shorts. If there's snow, because those are the only two different kinds of weather we have, I go for long trousers. So first I look outside. Then I have to make a decision. If it's sunshine, I take this path and put on shorts. Another day, it might be colder. So when I look outside and have to make a decision, I saw snow. So I take this path and put on trousers. This means that my complete morning routine looks like this from start to end. I get out of bed, look outside and decide, depending on the weather, to put on either shorts or trousers. And then, no matter what I chose, I put on my shoes. And then, and only then, remembering the complaints from the neighbors, I go outside. And yes, this diagram is actually on the wall next to my window. See? A decision is also sometimes called branching, since it creates two or more independent flows or branches in the activity diagram. In my morning routine, we can talk about there being two branches, the sunshine branch where I put on shorts and the snow branch where I put on trousers. You will also see this a lot in games where the activities branch out depending on whether the player did something good like picking up a coin or something bad like getting shot or hurt. And often the ending of the game will also be two different branches depending on whether the player won or lost. And that concludes the basics of activity diagrams. So far they are quite similar to other kinds of flowcharts or decision trees that you might have come across. But they do have some more advanced features that makes them extra convenient for describing games. First of all, we have the possibility of repetition. As mentioned, actions can only happen in the order the arrows are pointing. But we can have arrows pointing back to earlier actions in the activity, so part of it repeats. Like this example, where I have to eat five cookies before burping. Rather than just having five identical actions after one another, I have sort of a loop where the same action repeats. So I eat a cookie, then I make a decision, where if I have eaten five, I burp, but else, and you can always use else as the other option if the decision is a simple one like this, else I eat a cookie again. And I check if I have eaten five and eat one again, and again, and again. And that was five, so I burp. And you might notice how this pattern could also be used in a game, where you have to collect a certain number of keys to continue to the next level, or where you get a game over when you have lost a certain number of lives. Parallel actions. In the introductory example, there were some actions where the order didn't matter, and they could even be performed at the same time in parallel. Here I have my evening ritual. I sit on the couch and then I split my actions between watching YouTube and eating pizza and drinking cola. Note that I can only drink cola when I'm finished eating pizza. Maybe if I could have a repetition here where I eat some pizza and drink some cola and then repeat until I've eaten it all. I can always put the leftover cola back in the fridge. Also note the join. I can only get off the couch when I've eaten all the pizza, drunk all the cola and watched all of YouTube. Quite a lot to watch all of YouTube. So all actions going into a join have to finish 
before the process can continue after the join. A signal indicates something happening to the activity, just like an action, but it isn't the activity itself that performs the action, rather it has it performed upon it. Like when the user clicks something in an interface, that is an action that will often lead to other actions and decisions, but it is initiated by the user. The diagram can have an arrow going into the signal flag to show that it waits for the user and another arrow going out that leads to what will happen when the user does whatever the flag describes. A signal could also be generated by the underlying platform, say when files have completed loading or an error has occurred with the network. But I recommend just using flags for user actions. For timers, you can use the convenient hourglass signal and just write how much time has to pass next to it. The arrow going into the timer starts it and when the time has passed, it continues by the arrow going out. And that concludes this introduction to activity diagrams. There are many more elements in the standard, such as these shown here. But beyond start and end, you can do almost everything you need to do with just actions and decisions maybe an optional split and join when necessary, and of course signals for user input and time, just to make it easier to understand. Because that is the main idea with activity diagrams, making your reader quickly understand a process. That is why you want to use a standard form of diagrams, rather than invent your own or write everything as clear text. Diagrams gives a quick, visual overview that helps the reader follow a flow. He can put his finger on the drawing and literally follow the actions around the diagram while running through them in his mind. Creating the diagram also helps you gather and structure your thoughts. When you just have an idea in your head, it isn't tested or tried and nobody can challenge it because nobody can see it, not even yourself. But drawing the diagram makes the idea tangible and you can critique and improve it alone or with others because now you can see it, try it and discuss it. That is also why there aren't explicitly right and wrong ways of drawing a diagram. As long as you use the symbols correctly so that others can understand them and you all agree on what it actually says, then the diagram is correct. Any mistakes are just needs for improvements in your original idea and the diagram is a great way of testing ideas long before implementing them in code. It is a way of fixing the problems long before they actually become problems. And remember, diagrams are intended to share ideas, not to be perfect and correct representations of a computer program. The program itself will do that once it is built. On a practical note, activity diagrams are very easy to create. You can use any tool you would otherwise use for drawing lines and sketches. I always recommend paper and pencil for the initial sketch, to get the thoughts down on paper. And pencil is preferable to pen, because you can erase lines and turn arrows around without confusing yourself with scratched out lines everywhere. If or when you want to draw on the computer, don't use a photo editor or graphical design program like Photoshop or Illustrator. Use a tool for drawing diagrams, where you can put text in boxes and attach arrows, so everything keeps together once you move it around. And please, start with the paper, then go to the computer. Drawings on a computer tend to look finished even if they are just rough sketches, so it's sometimes easy to forget to fix the sketched experiments once the drawing nears completion. Enjoy!